So last week I gave you a little bit of a kind of historical conceptual overview of cognitive neuroscience and delved into particular methods around how you record electrical activity in the brain uh, by sticking electrodes in and measuring the actual ele electrical activity of neurons uh, directly and invasively or from the scalp in methods such as EEG where you time lock the EEG to presenting events like faces and so on which is called event related potentials. And you see this change in electrical activity over the scalp that you can then link to cognitive function. So see how this changes when you change from one face to another, when it's a familiar versus unfamiliar face and so on. And that's how you kind of understand cognition through these brain-based methods. So today I'm also talking about methods in cognitive neuroscience, talking about brain imaging, and then lesion methods of brain stimulation. And then the next lecture I go to talk about specific topics. So when we think about uh, brain imaging, one of the kind of hooks I'll use is, you know, what can we really gain from this? And what are the limits on actually putting uh, somebody, say, into an fMRI scanner and figuring out what's going on in their head, what they're thinking about, whether they're thinking about, for instance, um, you know, their pets versus their partner, whether they're uh, thinking about particular memory experiences, or not. can we do that? That's not the traditional way in which we actually use brain imaging. So we normally use brain imaging in a more controlled way in which we're presenting things to people so we know exactly what they're thinking about because we're in charge of the stimuli and the tasks. So that's a standard way of doing it, but can we also get out of through this reverse angle? So I'll come back to this uh, because I said to write a, a, a paper on lie detection, but for most of it, I'll be talking about conventional fMRI, which you present tasks and stimuli and you'll see what's happening. And functional imaging is basically um, what's termed hemodynamic methods, so changes in the blood supply to the brain as a result of what's going on in the neurons. And the main method here is fMRI, which is really kind of uh, now the bread and butter of kind of cognitive uh, neuroscience. But it's worthwhile separating um, these kind of methods from the kind of uh, recording method, electrical recording methods that I talked about last time. Because basically, fMRI is measuring changes in blood flow, not the electrical activity. And there's a bit of a chain reaction between uh, how you go from the neurons sort of functioning electrically and the changes in blood flow. And the story is something like this. That basically, as neurons are um, firing, so generating action potentials, generating electrical cur cur uh, currents, this is very energy con uh, consuming. So in order to get their energy, they need more oxygen. Neurons don't store oxygen, they get it from the blood supply, and the brain has a rich blood supply, all the brain has lots of capillaries, uh, and so on going in it. So when neurons are firing, they're using up oxygen, and they're converting oxyhemoglobin to deoxyhemoglobin. And this is a, a relatively slow process. Um, the, the, when neurons kind of consume, uh, uh, when they uh, produce electrical potentials, the actual getting oxygen to them takes several seconds. And basically that is the profile that you're measuring uh, with fMRI. So it's got a slow temporal resolution. It takes several seconds for this kind of um, oxygen uh, levels to actually change and be detected. But what you can do is that you can detect where things are happening really well. So it's the opposite to ERPs in that you can say where things are happening, but relatively slow when things are happening for a time. How many people have uh, taken part in a, an fMRI study of the, the brain? Not many, a few. So you do see adverts <coughs> around. If you're interested, we have one on campus, and it's called uh, CISP, this acronym here, C-I-S-C, uh, Brighton and Sussex Medical School. It's in the science car park. You can take part. They'll give you a little bit of money, but they will give you a 3D image of your brain. Okay? You'll get to see it in all the cross-sections, like as a movie. Uh, and so we're always looking for, for volunteers. Uh, and you can learn a little bit about you know, how these experiments work. Um, this is the, the, the procedure, is that you go into this uh, magnetic force, and this has a big coil in it in which you've got uh, electrical and magnetic uh, currents going in. I'll say something a little bit about that. <coughs> so fMRI is, is safe. It doesn't use radioactivity. It uses very big uh, magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields are detecting the amount of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin in individual uh, small little regions of the brain. And these changes in oxy and deoxyhemoglobin is called the Bold response, which stands for blood oxygen level 
And the way that this uh, changes over time is really the, uh, the fMRI uh, signature of this, and it's called a hemodynamic response function. So basically what you've got here is your bowl signal, which is, you can think of it as being the amount of oxygenated uh, blood in a region, and here you've got time in seconds. So you can see that this is a relatively long time scale in, in your seconds, well, the sub-seconds. And this is what, what happens if uh, a part of the brain is, is being activated in fMRI. What happens is that initially, if uh, parts of the brain is, is active, electrically active, it consumes oxygen. So what you have is more uh, deoxygenated uh, blood here. So here, this is a lack of oxygen. Now, what happens as a result of this lack of oxygen is that the capillaries dilate. They become wider, and you pump more blood into that. So you end up with more oxygen in, the re in, in there. And this is what's happening here, is that you're pumping in a lot more oxygen into the region to compensate the fact that this is metabolically uh, active. And that's effectively what you're measuring in fMRI. And it's a little bit paradoxical, because although neurons are consuming oxygen, you end up with more oxygen in that region. Okay? And the reason is that you're overcompensating. You're saying, you don't want this part of the brain to starve. I'm going to give it more than what it needs. So, um, so that is, in effect, the measure that you're using. Then eventually it goes back to normal. Your veins kind of then open up, and then the oxyhemoglobin uh, kind of increases there. And then eventually you get back. Uh, and in effect, what you're doing in an fMRI experiment is that you're measuring this hemodynamic response function not just once, but tens of thousands of times at every little point in the brain to see which brain regions are kind of uh, showing a, a change in responsiveness. Uh, and time zero here would be presenting a stimuli, having a thought, whatever it is that's going on uh, in the, the scan. <coughs> what you might kind of wonder here is that does that mean that fMRI experiments are really slow, that you have to wait until 20 odd seconds before you can present your next stimuli, because you've got to wait for things to go to baseline. And you don't, because basically what happens is, is that if you present stimuli lots and lots of times, that you can kind of superimpose these different, uh, these different functions. So imagine you're in an experiment, and each one of these lines is that you're being presented with a stimulus. Say you're being presented with a face, for instance. And a face is being presented in, say, four seconds, eight seconds, and so on, with some gaps in between when maybe you see houses or maybe you see mm -hmm. at all. So that's what you're actually presenting to the participants. And this is your model of how the brain responds to seeing uh, faces in the, in the world of fMRI. And in effect, what you're doing is that you're putting one of those on each one of those events. So if you imagine putting that on there and on here, so here you're summing together lots of these things, and you've got this big peak here, but here you've got a little gap, and it goes down, and so on. So in effect, what you're doing is that this is what you're predicting a brain region would look like if it's responding to these particular stimuli. It will show this kind of up-down pattern, which is basically how the brain responds to seeing the stimuli and the order in which the stimuli is presented. So in effect, in fMRI, what you're doing is asking which brain regions show a pattern that looks like that. Okay. Uh, and if you find those brain regions, what you do is you colour them in, in red, yellow, and whatever. And that's, in effect, what you see when you look at um, you know, slides of brain imaging uh, in lectures or when you open a brain imaging paper, is that you are seeing what's a map of statistical significance. So you're not seeing electrical activity. At that point, you're not even seeing blood flow. You're seeing something like a T value or an R value or something that you would have in your kind of statistics lectures or a P value, typically, so a measure of significance. Uh, and that's, in effect, how you go from electrical firing to, to these kinds of complex or beautiful brain maps. One of the problems that you've got here is that, as we know, kind of in statistical sciences, is that how do you know that something is real and it's not just happening for ch by chance? So in psychology, we have these kind of thresholds that we have P is less than 0 0.05, we call it significant. What that means, actually, is that there's a 1 in 20 chance that something is significant when it shouldn't. And most of the time, we're kind of happy with that as being you know, an okay assumption. But if you imagine that you're doing 20,000 t-tests in the brain, 
then all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is a problem, not a problem, because if one in 20 are active by chance, you're going to see almost like sprinkling pepper over, over the brain. You'll see things that, that appear to be active uh, that, that just aren't. So how do we deal with that? And I'll come back to that. But that's also another important consideration, because although what's going on in the brain, although this is biologically real and so on, all, we, all our measurements are still statistical. So you, this, we still don't know what is real brain activity versus spontaneous uh, changes versus kind of neural noise and so on. So, uh, so you kind of have imagined that, that, that when you're looking in the brain that this is kind of the gospel truth of what's happening. But actually it's a lot of interpretation, a lot of statistical assumptions, just as there are when you're running any other kinds of experiments. And that's partly as a result of the complexity of the data. When you're dealing with 20,000 data points, how do you know which ones are the real ones? So that's, again, a limitation of just putting someone in an FRI scan and figuring out what they're thinking. And basically, the reason, or one of the reasons behind this is that it's not the case that your brain is constantly silent and then occasionally it engages in, in, in thought. Uh, but also, it's certainly not the case that your brain is physiologically kind of dead or silent. I and mean, the only time in which your brain is physiologically dead is when you are dead. Okay. The rest of the time, your brain is constantly consuming oxygen, constantly having blood flowing uh, through it. So there's no, there's no off time for your brain. It is always there physiologically, if not cognitively. Okay. Um, so in effect, what you're, we're wanting to do in order to understand how the brain kind of does cognitive functions is we want to look at relative differences. So um, how is the brain response changing as a result of seeing faces relative to a baseline of doing nothing or relative to a baseline of looking at houses <coughs> or relative to a baseline of looking at a face upside down, whatever it is. Okay? So in a way, again, you know, with fMRI, it's a bit like um, you know, it's only as good as your experimental Design, even though you're measuring you know, the most complex known organ in the universe, <laughs> it's uh, your experimental design, so your, your data will be uh, So this is just an example of how you kind of can make inferences uh, with, with brain imaging, or how you can isolate different cognitive components. And this is a classic study. So PET was the forerunner of FMRI, <coughs> which uses radioactivity rather than deoxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. Okay, but it's the same. <coughs> and what this uh, kind of classic study wanted to do is find out what parts of the brain are involved in processing words. And here they're written words that might be read. So what you would imagine is that you would have a simple kind of cognitive model of how uh, somebody would achieve that. So if they see a word like cake, they would analyze this in terms of the curves and the lines and the edges and the uh, inception and so on. After the visual analysis, the idea is that there is a store of words within that brain that says, yes, I recognize this letter pattern. So you're then mapping that onto something that is familiar. And then after this, you do something with it. So you either get the meaning of this, or you get the sound of it. In their particular experiment, the way that they assess the meaning of the words is they got people um, to generate a verb for it. So a verb that goes with cake would be eat, or bake, or cook, or something but a participant has to actively engage in that. Or you just say the word aloud. Okay. So this is a, a model uh, of this. So how can you kind of isolate different <coughs> cognitive processes in the brain? So this is the, the kind of task that they do where they have experimental kind of conditions versus baseline. So in order to figure out what part of the brain is involved in the visual processing of words, so this stage here, um, these stages here, what you would do is that you would have a, um, in one condition you would view words, and in the other condition you would just view a fixation across there. And the idea is that both of these involve visual processing, uh, but only one of them involves word recognition. So when you compare brain activity to seeing words versus brain activity to seeing across, what you're getting rid of is low level visual processing, and what you're left is that part of the brain that's interested specifically in words as opposed to any kind of visual material. And you get, for instance, this part of the, the brain here. You get other parts as well that's involved in that. In another condition, what they're interested in is what part of the brain is involved in saying words aloud. 
So what they do here is that they take a task where you read the word aloud, and then here the baseline would be just seeing the word. So what was really the task here becomes your baseline there. And the idea here is that the baseline of just passively viewing a written text <coughs> involves visual processing, and it involves some word recognition. Where saying the word involves visual processing, word recognition, and then generating speech. So the idea is when you compare that against that, that these things cancel out. And the thing that you're left with is the, um, the, the brain regions that support saying the word, but not involved in seeing the word. That these are common to both the, the baseline task and the experimental task. And you get another. And then finally, what you might have is that you've got a task, what parts of the uh, brain are used for retrieving meaning, so understanding the word. So your task here might be that you see the word cake and you have to generate a verb, such as eat, uh, versus your baseline here is saying the word aloud. So both your, um, your task and your baseline involve speech, <coughs> but one involves just reading the word and the other involves doing something more complex with it. You're having to go beyond the information given and generate something so here, this all involves visual processing, all involves word recognition, all involves uh, saying something with your mouth, but one involves uh, word, word view. So again, what you're doing here is you're dissecting cognition into different uh, components and seeing what's different. And this is all well and good, and this is kind of the staple of what we're doing, but again, the results you get depend actually on uh, what you do. So here, is this a good baseline for recognising words? But it's not really, because a, a single cross, a fixation cross, is not as big as a written word. So a written word takes up more uh, physical space than that. So you're better off with a series of crosses. All the kinds of baseline that other people would have is that they would then have an unfamiliar uh, language. So for instance, you compare seeing an English word with, say, compare seeing a Hebrew word, assuming you're not a Hebrew speaker. So here you've got things that are matched in terms of complexity but only one thing your brain can recognise, the other is just, in effect, visual garbage uh, to your brain. And you will get different results depending on what, what it is you're comparing to. So finding out what parts of the brain are involved in written word recognition will depend on what is it you're comparing it against. Are you comparing it against seeing nothing? In which case you're just looking at vision itself and it's nothing to do with words. Uh, or are you comparing it against particular things? And that becomes rather problematic because you get these kind of inconsistencies. Also here, that what you've got there is reading the word aloud. So you're assuming that, um, that here, that what you're doing is the process of producing speech. But actually, as soon as I say something, I hear what I say. So what you've got here is that not only do you get the parts of the brain involved in saying things, you get the parts of the brain involved in hearing things. And you might draw a false conclusion that your auditory cortex is involved in speech production, which it isn't. But as soon as you say something, you are then going to hear it. So what would be an appropriate baseline there? It might be, for instance, uh, saying something but not being able to hear your own words, for instance, or saying something versus hearing somebody else say it, so you're cancelling out the, the kind of the auditory feedback. So again, although you've got these kind of nice cognitive models, what you get happening in the brain depends entirely on what you kind of put in there. There are other kind of ways uh, of, of doing this as well, where instead of just comparing one thing against another, you kind of have what are called parametric designs. So you change a variable continuously. So instead of kind of comparing A and B, you compare A when it's quiet, A when it's loud, and so on. And that's kind of what's being done here. So all that's happening here is that the person is being presented with words, spoken words, and the rate <coughs> of speech varies. So sometimes it goes really, 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 really fast, and sometimes it goes really, really slow. Okay. And what you find here is you've got three different regions of the brain that are involved in uh, processing words, but they should all show this very different kind of pattern. So this particular part of the brain, your auditory cortex, <coughs> responds when you're hearing words, but in this kind of graded fashion. So the more words you've got, the more it responds. Okay? This part of the brain here kind of does the same thing, but it has this kind of step change between silence and words. So in effect, you could say that this part of the brain is involved interest in the presence of language versus the absence, and less so in the amount of language. 
uh, that they're showing these different kind of responsive profiles. Was this one here in the frontal lobes, uh, basically, this is kind of involved in working memory, uh, potentially. And what you have here is that if you have very few words or none, it's not interested. And then, all of a sudden, it starts to respond strongly. So this is a, a blood flow here, regional cerebral blood flow. It responds strongly there, so it's a little bit like a bowler. But then, as you've got so many words, it kind of switches off. It's like, oh, I'm giving up. This is too fast for me to follow. I'm switching off now. But again, what you would have is that if you ran an experiment that contrasted fast speech against very slow speech, you would then compare, say, that data point with that data point and conclude that this part of the brain is not responding to speech. Okay? Just because you've selected something that's very fast and something that's very slow, but in fact it's, it is responding to speech, it's responding to something intermediate between the two values that you've chosen. Okay? So here you would have drawn a false conclusion that this part of the brain is not responding to speech, for instance. Okay? Uh, and similarly here you might, if you chose this value and this value, you might not be able to show that actually it is responding to speech. If you have silence as your baseline, you would show that, that actually this part of the brain really is interested in uh, speech. So how do we kind of analyze this brain imaging uh, data, given the, the complexity of having thousands and tens of thousands of different data points? So this is one approach of um, dealing with the, the problem that I talked about earlier. But basically, if you're, at, if you're looking at a brain image and you have P is less than 0 0.05, then one in 20 brain regions will be active by chance. And in effect, what you do is that you make an assumption that, um, that uh, the things that are working together as neighbours would be a real thing, and isolated things will, will be kind of noise in your data, things that you're not interested. And in effect, what you do is that you kind of smooth your data, which sounds a little bit dodgy, but it's not. It's increasing the actual value of uh, the signal. But it's assuming that this kind of blob here, so each one of these is a little brain region, so they're called voxels. So a pixel is what you've got on your screen, and a voxel is a 3D equivalent of a pixel. It's another way of thinking about it. And that's what we're dealing with. So all these voxels here are significant. But what you do is that you kind of spread the significance Around. In fact, you're just superimposing a normal distribution on each one of those, so you're spreading uh, the, the kind of color to notice. What this means is that this voxel here, which in and of itself wasn't significant, becomes significant because it's receiving kind of shared activity from this one, this one, this one, this one. So in effect, this region here gets turned on. It becomes stronger as a result of this process. Whereas this one here has no neighbors to support it. So it starts to receive this kind of negative uh, energy, if you will, or this negative statistical influence from its neighbors, and it gets switched off. And this is one way of dealing with the problem of having kind of one in 20 regions by chance, is that you will have only those regions, you know, if everything was just like a mosaic, then there's no reason why they would cluster together in the, the same so it's making the assumption that this here is not relevant, whereas this here is. Uh, and, and it's kind of a, like a rich gets richer kind of uh, process. It also compensates for individual difference in anatomy. So basically what you might find is that if my part of the brain here is involved in word recognition and your part's there, that they will never overlap. But actually blurring them out kind of increases the chances that the two regions will kind of overlap. But this is also a problem. So basically, if the brain kind of implements cognition as a mosaic, as lots of little regions which aren't next to each other, then functional imaging will often be blind to that in a lot of standard analyses. But I'll talk about some non-standard analyses here. <coughs> so there are other kind of possible issues with brain imaging as well in terms of how we can interpret uh, the signal. And that's that basically um, what is metabolically costly is the, um, the electrical energy of the synapse and, and this kind of chemical um, uh, reactions of the, the, the synapse. This is what requires the oxy deoxygen trade. But this happens both when uh, signals are excitatory, so in which um, one, two neurons positively influence each other, but also when they're inhibitory, when one is positive and the other is switching it off. 
So in FY, you can't actually tell the difference between synapses that are working like this and synapses that are working like that. So it might be that some region, regions are, appear to be active, but that's only because they're being actively switched off rather than actively switched off. Okay? And you can't tell that because the synapses will be equally active and will be both uh, triggering this cascade of changes. At the moment, we don't have uh, solutions around this. Uh, what, what you might be able to do would be to kind of have radio labeled kind of GABA, which is your inhibitory uh, neurotransmitter, for instance, and be able to kind of understand this. But at the moment, we're not quite uh, at that end. Uh, and deoxyhemoglobin doesn't care what, what the neurotransmitter is, it's just is it being active. Most neural activity, about 90% of the neurons are excitatory. So the assumption is, is that they tend to look. Well, this all, and it's also worthwhile saying how this kind of differs from um, uh, studies looking at brain lesions. So studies of brain lesions were obviously popular you know, from the 19th century onwards. So if you think about Broca's patients who had a stroke in his frontal lobe and lost the ability to speak. When brain imaging was taken off, people say, oh, we won't need to rely on patients anymore because we can use kind of in vivo uh, imaging. But actually, the, um, the, the direction of kind of cause and effect is different. So in kind of lesion studies, you are actually causally manipulating the brain. You are experimentally kind of changing the brain and measuring uh, behavior. Effect. So what you're doing here is that you're manipulating which brain regions are lesions, and you're measuring the behavior. In fMRI, you're doing the opposite thing. You're manipulating the behavior and measuring the brain regions. So by manipulating the behavior, what I mean is that you present different stimuli or different tasks to the participants, and the thing you're measuring is what's going on in the brain. So actually, these two approaches are complementary. They're not doing exactly the same thing. And some people argue that brain imaging kind of tells you uh, really uh, what's how, what regions might be important, whereas these tell you what regions are actually. So you might have some brain regions which are kind of listening in, if you will, to a process, but they're not actually actively uh, manipulating it. And that, that's kind of what I mean by this. So I'm not trying to kind of dysfunctional imaging. I think it's a really powerful method, but I am trying to introduce a, uh, a note of skepticism. And also to make you think that actually it's not the case that one method is necessarily better than the other. The different methods have their, uh, their own relative advantages and disadvantages. And what I'd like to do is just kind of illustrate this with a concrete example of how brain imaging data uh, might conflict with um, data from brain damaged patients and appear to reveal different results. So here, um, what uh, this is kind of representing is what parts of the brain might be involved in semantic memory. So our store of uh, the meaning of words and objects, our kind of uh, conceptual knowledge of the world. So what a lot of um, uh, brain imaging studies, including the, the one that I presented earlier from Peter Natal found, is that when you put people in a scanner and get them to engage in kind of semantic memory retrieval, that you activate this part of the uh, uh, the, the the frontal lobes, uh, actually it's Broca's area here, part of the Broca's area. So the kind of task involved here is a sort of verb generation. So I say um, cake and you say eat, for instance, and that's the kind of region. What you would hope to find is that if you take a group of patients who got damage to semantic memory, so people who've lost the ability to understand words uh, and produce speech, that in fact they would also have damage to that part of but actually, if you take a group of patients who have uh, damage to their, really severe damage to their somatic memory system, you get a different brain region coming out, and that's this region here, the temporal lobes. So it seems that functional imaging studies are saying, hang on, this brain region seems to be important. Whereas if you take a bunch of patients with problems in somatic memory, this region. which is um, a variant of frontotemporal dementia. It's different from Alzheimer's disease. 
uh, and it, it affects language when it's sensed from the temporal lobes uh, more than kind of the classic kind of being amnesic, which is the, the cardinal symptom uh, of Alzheimer's. So here he, um, although he couldn't produce uh, the, the words, he was actually speaking. It wasn't that he couldn't speak. He was actually speaking in fluent sentences. It's just that every animal was a cat or a dog, or he wasn't sure. So he had lost the ability to differentiate concepts. All concepts were similar to each other, and in fact, kind of regressing to the most simple kind of uh, earliest or high-frequency concepts that he knows, in this case, uh, cats and dogs and so on. We'll, we'll talk about somatic dementia in detail in another lecture. But basically, that, that's what's going on uh, here. Any questions about the patient? Um, so, so the question here, why is it that, um, that you know, he, some, somebody like him would have damage here? And why is it that the brain imaging would necessarily pick up on this? Actually, an alternative approach here would be to instead of looking at uh, patients who've got damage to semantic memory, so look at patients with damage here and say, what is it that these patients can't do? And that way you're directly contrasting um, the, the information from functional imaging that this brain region seems to be important relative um, <coughs> to that one there. What you find is if, if you look um, at patients who have damage to the, this region of kind of Broca's area in the left frontal lobe, is that they don't show these symptoms that, that I just showed, but they do have subtle problems in being able to uh, do the kinds of tasks that were done in the, the, the scanner. So for instance, they have particular problems in generating, um, uh, for instance, verbs when there's no obvious answer. So if I give a word to you like scissors, it will be quite easy to generate a verb of cut. Whereas if I give you um, uh, something like cat, it's far less clear what that verb would be. Uh, so it's not, you could stroke it, you could do that. But either way, you've kind of got to search your semantic memory. There isn't one obvious answer that pops out. And actually what we find is that although these patients here don't present as having very profound uh, problems in semantic knowledge, they have problems in searching their semantic knowledge when the answer is not immediately obvious. Uh, so, so again, this is more probably a problem in retrieving or deciding amongst competing alternatives uh, when, when there isn't an obvious answer that comes to mind. So actually, it might not be that the, 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 either one of these approaches is wrong. It might just be that, um, that they're doing somewhat different things in semantic memory, that this is the store of knowledge and that this is the way in which you access that. So one question is, why then is this region not coming out in the brain imaging studies? Well, it doesn't some and not all, but, but what might be the case is that, for instance, if you go back to this um, Peterson study here, that it's making the assumption that reading a word out aloud does not involve semantic memory, and only generating the verb involves semantic memory. Of course, if reading word alouds, word, words aloud does involve semantic memory, and then generating a verb from a word involves semantic memory, that when you compare one task against the other, they will just cancel out. It will look as if um, the, the brain will respond equally strongly to both. So when you see, is it different, it will say, no, it's not different. And it will appear that the brain is not interested, or that region of the brain is not interested in such things for these years. Okay. So these are, again, subtle arguments, but this is kind of crucial because... Uh, we have to kind of understand that these methods are not foolproof and it depends on the kind of cognitive models. <coughs> so, to come back to the, um, uh, the, the original kind of question that I asked is that can you then put somebody into an fMRI scan and figure out what's going on in their head? And the simple answer to this is no, not in any straightforward way. But actually, there are some kind of subtle things that, that you can do that, that would make sense. So, for instance, at one level, you could put somebody in a scanner and figure out whether they're seeing or speaking. For instance, you could easily do that from the signal because they're just, they're, they're, they would be so different from rest for this kind of task. But that, that's quite far from being able to look at these subtle things. But people have uh, actually pushed this really far and said, actually, if we throw away some of the other assumptions in, in 
kind of use alternative approaches, we can actually do far more uh, sophisticated things. So this is something called multi-voxel pattern analysis, that instead of looking at big blobs, you're looking at the kind of the pattern uh, across them. So here you don't do this thing called smoothing. You do not do that. You treat each one uh, as being potentially equally informative. And the idea here is that if you've got your auditory cortex um, there, for instance, uh, and you present it with two sounds like ra and la, for instance, that it might just be that, that it activates different neurons within that part of the brain, but the neurons are arranged like this, that so they're just kind of all interleaved. So if you average out that region, it will look like that region is interested in both of them equally, because you haven't got that fine spatial resolution. But instead, if you look at individual millimetres within that, you might find a cluster of neurons that responds more to ra than la, and la relative to this. And this is kind of what you've got there, is that here you've got a hypothetical pattern uh, of activity in this region that responds to ra, and one that responds to, to la, for instance, here. Now, if you average these out, they will look as if the, the same. But actually, if you do more fancy stats, you can show that they're, they're different. Uh, and this is the kind of approach that, that, that's been done in order to kind of get things down. So let me just kind of uh, explain that with some more concrete examples. So this is the way that you would do that in order to figure out what exactly somebody is seeing or potentially thinking. And the key thing is, is that you have to have a, tra a training phase and, and a test phase in order to do that. Uh, so what you would do in phase one is that I, you would present somebody with a whole bunch of images of cats and a whole bunch of, say, images of dogs. It can be any other categories that you might have. And what you do, as before, is that you look at the pattern of activity in different regions. So just as here, you're looking at the, the kind of the microstructure across all these different uh, kind of voxels. Yeah. What you then do is that you figure out, <coughs> using fancy procedures called machine learning, you figure out what exactly uh, is the best kind of way of discriminating cats from dogs, uh, and you, you, uh, it, it kind of does it for you. So each one of these here, this would be um, dogs, and these would be cats here, and you create this kind of decision boundary. And what you have here is that here you've got some errors, so that would be, for instance, a dog that is incorrectly labelled as a cat, and so on. Uh, so that would be an error, but here you might be able to distinguish cats and dogs 80-90% of the what you would then do is present the brain with a whole series of images of cats and dogs that the person wasn't trained on before and see, can it predict that? So you take the, the, the kind of dog-like pattern of brain activity, the cat-like pattern of activity, and see which one is this most like. Is it most like cats or most like dogs? And can you do that? And the answer is you can, and you can do it with about 90% accuracy with uh, binary categories such as dogs and cats and faces and houses and so on. So here you're literally just presenting images um, and you're figuring out which of two categories a person is seeing just from reading um, their brain activity. But the point is you can't do it cold. You can't just put somebody in a scanner and do this. You have to pre-train them. You have to show them lots of images of cats and dogs first. Then you can show them a novel image and link it to the previous thing. So you need that existing knowledge base of how their individual brain responds to cats and dogs. And then you can go in there that is actually it again. Now the key thing is, what about if you don't present them with cats and dogs and you ask them to imagine a cat and a dog? Can you do it? And the answer is yes, with exactly the same accuracy of about 90%. So at that point, you are literally reading somebody's thoughts to a reasonable degree of accuracy. But you, it's highly constrained because it's binary choice and you've already pre-tested their brains on the categories to understand how it works. So it's still clever. I'm not taking anything away from it, but, but it's not a cold brain reading that, that you do. And here, this is a study um, done with uh, future intentions, where basically you present two numbers on the screen, and you have to either add or subtract them. Okay? But you can read somebody's brain before they've made the responses to what they're doing. You can tell whether somebody's going to add those two numbers together. So it's five or two. The answer is either three or seven. Okay? But just from the numbers, before the person has told them the answer, you can figure out whether it's more likely to be an 
is kind of decoding what people are seeing from their visual cortex. So let me be clear what this isn't, is that you aren't um, literally putting somebody in a scanner and re looking at the back of the brain and seeing images in there. What you're seeing is something like pepper being sprinkled over the table where the, the different neurons respond for different things. Then you generate a kind of a, a machine learning thing that says when this is active and that's active, it means something's up here, and then you reconstruct the image. So you're not looking at somebody's brain and seeing images. You're, you're looking at things flashing in the brain and you're reconstructing what's going on uh, using complex algorithms. But this is what you can do, is that you can present people with individual letters and you can try to reconstruct the image that was seen just based on the, uh, the brain activity that was observed. Okay? So this is uh, neuron here. Uh, <coughs> here what they did is that they used uh, complex uh, images. So what, what they did is that they would show images like this and they would try to uh, reconstruct it um, here. This is using fine detail. So they looked at, um, well, I say neurons, they're voxels which contain hundreds of, or thousands of neurons. That's what you're looking at in fMRI. And you can then look at how these respond to different kinds of points in space and so on. And you can do a kind of image reconstruction. So here, this is using fine grained information about the image. And here, this is using coarse information about the image. And here, what they do is that they, they train the brain effectively on a set of images like this. And then they present it with a set of images that weren't seen and say, what is the best match image? So in effect, what they do is that they say that that is the closest image in the secondary database that they can find. So they're not presenting it with the initial image. They're just effectively searching Google and saying, right, find an image that looks like what that person is seeing. Okay? And that is done without asking the person anything. You're literally just looking in there. Hi. Uh, could you use um, ODI or like Noddy uh, protocols to actually look at the orientation? Um, yeah, so those kind of protocols are done for structural imaging. So these are just looking at the, it, it is the, the same kind of bold response of the blood oxygen level uh, thinking. Now, whether or not if you kind of know anything more about the structure of the brain, whether that will help you to, to decode the, the actual functional activity, I don't know. So that, that, that's kind of your question. Yeah. But the, the, the thing that you're measuring here is still the, the same bold activity that I started. So where does this take us? Actually, despite a bit of scepticism about fMRI, it, it's surprising what you can do with it. And where is it going? So here, what I'm going to get you to do is figure out where is this taking us? Is this taking us to some kind of big brother state in which you really can read people's brains? What are the limits on uh, being able to, uh, to do this? In particular, thinking about lie detection. So could you put somebody in a brain scan and figure out whether they're lying, what would you have to do? What would you have to train them on in the beginning in order to be able to uh, check whether something was a lie or not a lie? And I suppose for those who are sceptical about this, the, the question is, why are you sceptical? Because the thing that creates lies is our brain, okay? It's not coming from any other part of our body. It's in there somewhere, okay? And that would be the challenge to you if you think that this is a complete waste of time is that it has to become